Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, it's the speaker from Hackerus, uh, called Nice, will bring us the topic, the software engineering part of data science. Let's welcome his talk. Hello. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. I, I, you know, I'm quite honored to speak in front of you right now. So, in this session, we're going to discuss the software engineering part of data science, and I think a lot of you might be able to relate. Just a show of hands, who among here are software engineers? Software engineers, come on, don't be shy. Why are you shy? Our job is high paying. Raise your hand. So. Yeah, brief introduction. Uh, you can call me Nins. I'm a software engineer at Hakarus, and I don't do front end. Um, I'm a studying. I'm studying student in the University of Tenay uh, Manila University in the Philippines. I'm a music enthusiast, and I love mushrooms. And I don't know. I like mushrooms and Rick and Morty. So, Rick, here is what we're gonna be like. As here's the topic that I'm going to introduce to you today. Uh, first, we're going to have a brief introduction of what, what's, what's the software engineering context in data science? How do software engineers live in a data science world? And then we're going to identify the challenges you know, that software engineers encounter in working in a data science team. We're going to try to find solutions based on our experience in our company. And then uh, I'm going to give uh, key points on if you want to convert yourself from a software engineer to a data scientist, what should you do? And yeah, we're going to discuss how Python bridges the gap between those two. Now, just a brief of context, software engineer, data scientist, NINs, office mates that are data scientists. What's the similarities between us? So the software engineers and the data scientists all have one goal in common, and it's to deliver an output. Product delivery, that's the main goal. But unfortunately, we have a lot of differences. Software engineers focus on code quality. I hope you all focus you know, on your code quality, while data scientists focus on model accuracy. We mostly uh, software engineers mostly deal with maintainability of the code. We use boilerplates, we define the architecture, we're very user-oriented, and we focus on the app development. While data scientists, they, they want to visualize their data, data is everything, data is king, and they focus more on mathematical computations. But we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about mostly the, we're not going to talk about the data science part. A lot of people talked about that today and yesterday. We're going to focus on this guy. Oh, the cup. So, uh, software engineer. Now, here's the thing. How many of here are software engineers that are collaborating with data scientists? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, the thing is, most of the data scientists' code are sometimes they're not clean. You know, you, well, we can't blame them, it's their job. But <laughs> sometimes it's not efficient as well. They're just gonna give you random Jupyter notebooks and what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> Models are often based on limited resource. Because let's face it, they have their Jupyter notebook or some uses sublime, and they don't have experience on scaling. So also one challenge is identifying the data formats. We quite don't have any idea on how the data formats work on the data science side. We have our own data formats on the software engineering side. So we really need to collaborate. And I cannot emphasize this. You know, this is very important. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Now, this is the usual workflow. This very talented data scientist right here, they just give us this. They have their models, and you know, sometimes they send it through Jupyter Notebook, at least in our setup. And then this guy right here, tries to apply these models to be able to come up with a simple application that usually utilizes those models. Now, 
Python is a good language in terms of that use case, mainly because the scientists use Python a lot. And there are a lot of software engineers that uses Python. So it's very easy. It's a common language. It's very easy to understand. There's a consistent setup. You can use PyEnv, PIFEnv, VirtualEnv, whatever. And it's very fast in terms of prototyping. Now, I've given you a brief introduction, and we're now going to move on to the development challenges. So that's literally my face every time a new project starts. Like, What's this requirement? I don't know. Help me. Now, starting the project. First and foremost, the data scientists must always align with the software engineers in terms of requirements. And this might go uh, counterintuitively, but never, ever, 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 ever go on high-level planning when you're discussing with the data scientists. And the main reason about it is that you want the specifications between the software engineer and the data scientists to be as granular and specific as possible. Because one simple miscommunication and, you know, everything's gone wrong, suddenly. Now, ask these questions. First is what data are we using? Everything is dependent on the data. Identify the data that you're using, that you're going to be using, and then who will be using the data? Those are the only two important questions. Now, after starting the project, after building the requirements, the next challenge that we as a software engineer face is the code standards. So, Anyone here who is using Jupyter Notebook? Do you have linters installed in your Jupyter Notebook? Do you have code formatters installed in your Jupyter Notebook? If the answer is no, then please install one. <laughs> it's very difficult to understand the code. If there's no proper like linters, the tabs, the spacing, it's not consistent. Ah, my OC is you know, triggering. So, if there will be errors, make the errors straight to the point. I'm going to show several examples later on how we dealt with this. And then, again, as a software engineer, be considerate. Do not expect 100% code quality from data scientists. Okay? It's not their job. It's your job. Utilize language feature. So, we use type hints. Familiar with type hints in Python? Who's, who uses type hinting? Oh my god, please use type hinting because Python is moving to a data type language now, which I don't know. So there's also data classes, and we're going to show several examples of that later. Now, once the standards have been in place, you've agreed on how you're going to proceed, we move with the bigger question. How's the architecture going to look like? What are the considerations? Now, based on our work experience, the number one question you always want to ask is how different algorithms consume resources. Okay? What are the limitations of your CPU? What are the limitations of your memory? And how does a storage option affect the process flow? We're going to show a lot of examples later. So, you know, I'm going to park it at that. And then another one is how do the models you know, how, how will the models be integrated to the application? How do you actually integrate a uh, machine learning code to, let's say, a web application? You know, those are two different things. What's the best way? We're going to discuss that later through interfaces and additionally communication protocols. And finally, you produce a POC, you have an output. Deployment. Where are you going to deploy? Local, cloud, mobile, microcontrollers, which is getting popular nowadays. How do you scale up in cloud environments? And how do you scale down? Yeah, you also need to scale down. How do you, need, uh, how do you scale down uh, in minimal resource environments? And then, of course, we need to have our continu continuous integration. Now, this is what we've learned. This is the solution. This is the meat of the talk. And that's Barney, you know him. We're going to first dive into 
data-driven development. Why? Because most of the time, this is the development approach that you're going to take, especially when you're starting your application. So, application structures, uh, it all depends on what are the data that's going to be used in your application. So, how, what are the results? What are the output? And then, how will the data transform throughout its life cycle? Now, Python provides several libraries that can be utilized. But here's the general idea of what I'm saying. Now, this is not the whole application. This is the application. Okay? You have your data source. You have your data storage. Your data storage can also be your data source. For the workflow, the first thing that you need to do is to analyze. Analyze your inputs. Am I using images? Am I using time series data? Am I using what? Social media activities? So just analyze it. And then based on your analysis, based on the transform, uh, based on the analysis of the data inputs, you now then need to transform your data. So who among here are data engineer, data engineers? So for you who doesn't quite understand what data engineering means, it basically means you're cleaning all the data up before you give them to the machine learning developers. You know, a lot of data cleaning, if none is, you know, if the data is none, you need to pre-fill it. So data engineers, anyone in the room? Yes, I feel your job. Try cleaning 40 million rows of data at once. So it's crazy. Now, after you've done through the transformation and the processing of the data, as a software engineer, we now need to apply the model, right? So we're going to dive in this part later. Then you're going to have the output. So whatever the output of the pipeline is, you're going to display it into your application. Generally, this is the high-level approach that we want to keep in mind when we're developing systems that integrate with machine learning models. Think about the data. Transform and pre-process the data every time. If you have data inputs and you directly apply the model, I'm you know, almost sure that you're going to get inaccurate results. So this is a crucial step. Uh, the application of the model will be discussed later. And then we're going to have the output that is going to be used by the application. Now, for the coding standards, uh, you have your general workflow. I'm going to show several code examples here. So um, for those who are quite kind of new to Python, please bear with me. I'm going to upload a more simpler implementation in my GitHub, probably after this presentation. So coding standards. The first one that we need, we'll discuss is the code quality. How do we ensure the code quality? Okay. And then how do we handle errors? So error handling is a bit important. Oh, it's really important because if you don't handle errors properly, your application is going to suck. Big time. And then we're going to discuss about data integrity, which falls on the pre-processing side of things. Again, I cannot emphasize this. God, data scientists are not software developers. Do not blame them if their code is bad. Again, do not discriminate them for not being able to write a good code. It's your job as software engineers to write a good code. Remember it every time. Or at least in most cases. Disclaimer. Now. For the code quality, again, data and application teams must use linters every time. Because if you're going to format everything from scratch, it's going to be like, oh my god, it's so tiring. So you need to define conventions and functions for interfaces. We're going to show code examples after this slide. Please do regular code reviews. Okay. So no matter who it is, just jump in it, review their code. It's very important so that you learn what the other person is doing. Now, use type hints and other tools that IDE utilizes. This one, for example. Anyone again familiar with type hinting? Have you seen this? Have you seen this code and this import before? Anyone? Okay, good. Uh, for those of you, for those of you who hasn't seen them, please use it, adopt it. It's gonna be the future of Python, I hope. Now, as you can see here, we have a class called user. And then, in the initialization function, we define name, age, is alive. Why, why did I use that property? That's so morbid. 
uh, and then hobbies. So right here we have the name and we define the name to be a string. And then we have age, we define it to be integer. Alive will be boolean, and then hobbies is a list of string. Now if you've used C or any other type languages before, it's kind of the same. But this goes a lot, especially this one. It says it returns an object. Okay, if, if, if it returns an object, then you know the linter or whatever IDE you use will identify if it's wrong or not. Now, let's just imagine that this code came from the data scientists. And let's just imagine that I removed the types. It's just name, age, alive, hobbies. How do you think, as a software engineer, how do you think, will I, uh, will, will I know what are the actual data types that's going to be used in this? For example, for age, it might be string. For name, it might be int. But I don't know who, anyone whose name is a number, so. For alive, it might be yes or no. For hobbies, it might be just a list of, you know, it might be a dictionary of strings. Or a dictionary, sorry, that's wrong. Um, but yeah, this is very helpful because when the data scientists give me their code, I look at their code, I say, ah, I know that this one is a string, I know that this one is integer, and this one's boolean. Right away. So use type hints. This is one of the best things that you can have when you're working with data scientists. Then we have error handling. We need to standardize the errors because the first thing that you need to understand is once the error happens in the machine learning side, you have no control over it. Once the error happens on the model side, you don't know what to do. So we're going to guide the data scientist to create meaningful errors, like this one. So as you can see here, uh, this is somewhat similar to, I think, what we're using into some of our projects. So we have a list of error, uh, errors that is thrown by the models itself. Now, there is not a uh, not latest version, not fitted exception, data size exception, no training data exception. And when I see these errors, I know right away what the error is about. So it's clear. Errors are clear and pretty much you know, descriptive. But this is on a case-to-case -case basis. So if your machine learning team have some sort of custom errors that they want, ask them to specify that error. Okay, it's very important. It's very important in the application side as well. Then for another one for the code quality is we need to have, you know, data integrity. What does this mean? So if the data comes in and the data comes out, software engineers need to make sure that the correct data came in and the correct data came out. If you don't do that, then, you know, just quit your job. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're not doing your job if you don't do that. So, pre-processing uh, should be atomic in nature for data integrity to work. Single operations per data only. Uh, the data outputs and results must be stored as granular as possible. What does this mean? This one right here is an example of uh, quote-unquote type data. So we have this class called training data. Uh, if you've used scikit-learn before, you might probably know that as uh, x and y. So fit x, y. And then usually it's just uh, an array, an umpy array, most of the time. But this one, for example, is pretty much, you know, it's, it's detailed. We have, you have the training data, and then uh, as usual, you have your type hints over here. It's very clear what the data needs, uh, what the class needs. Then you have three properties. You have the actual data. You have the label of the data, which is probably the y value. So this is the x value. This is the y value. And this is, ad this is additional information about the data. So why do we need to be as eloquent as this? Mainly because in real world scenarios, you don't know what kind of data you will encounter. That's guaranteed. This gives you more control and power over the data. 
putting structures like this helps the software development team and the data science team to better understand what data are they dealing with. In this case, for example, you know that this is a training data. It's not a testing data, it's not some sort of other data. This is training data. So the model will only accept this type of object. So class definition is very important. Now, for the data integrity, it's pretty much simple. These are your processes. That's going, this, this is what the data traverses. As you can see, it's very clear. After the data cleaning, the data will probably go on to a principal component analysis, you know, getting the correlations. Then it will go to a feature reduction. Then it will go to training or prediction. You cannot combine these two steps. Well, you can, but it's not advisable. So as much as possible, if you can separate steps, separate them, so that you'll be able to identify the errors. If the error came here, then you know that it's from here. But if the two are mixed up, you're not quite sure what happened. Maybe the error is on the principal component analysis. Maybe it's on the data cleaning. I don't know. So again, separate each concerns so that the data will, you know, the, the operation on the data is atomic, singular. And the next one is the granularity of your results. So let's say I have here uh, the raw image, and then I have a list of annotations on the image. And then the processed image is actually black and white. Maybe that's what your algorithm uses. If you have three separate data sets, and you're diligent enough to make sure that they're distinguishable from each other, then you can play around with this data set. So if you only want a processed image, maybe you can combine the annotation and the black and white image. You'll produce the processed image. Or if you want the raw image, but you want a result overlay, maybe you can combine the raw image and the annotations image. Because if you combine them at once, and then if you return them, if your application is not well designed, then you cannot extract these two. So if you can extract a data from previous data sources, please do that. It gives the feeling of, you know, modularization, and the data is really granular. Now, we're going to move on to the architectural uh, challenges. Some of this might be a bit technical, so for those of you who, who has no clue on, you know, some of this, just ask questions sir, later. Or we can discuss it. We need to discuss this. This is pretty much not discussed most of the time. Memory versus CPU. Some algorithms that's used in some models are very CPU intensive. Anyone familiar with k-means? Yeah, that's the starting algorithm for people who want to learn machine learning, right? K-means clustering. KNN, you know, don't be shy. Now, that one requires a lot of calculation. You have uh, time, space complexity of N and time complexity of I forgot, sorry. But it requires a lot of computation, and computation is done where? In the CPU. So we can say that it's probably CPU intensive. Then, for model storage, you need memory. So you need to be very careful if your model sizes are too big then it might be difficult to store them on uh, limited resource machines. So you need to consider that kind of algorithm that the model uses. So I'm a software engineer, OK? But I have to learn what is this algorithm, how does this algorithm work. It's not my job, but I have to learn it because I need to know those information so that I can produce a better system. So it's, it's not like, oh, they're data scientists. Let them do their stuff. No. If you're a responsible software engineer, you must learn this stuff as well. So again, I think those of you who attended uh, RCTO's previous talk, uh, sparse modeling, so it's, it's very good in performing a smaller resource. If you're interested, just talk to him there. Or get the slides. There. Yeah. Now, multi-threading and multi-processing. Anyone familiar with multi-threading and multi-processing here? Do you know the difference? of threads versus process. So it's, this is very like on the computer architecture side of things. 
But as a, software in, as a software engineer working in a data science field, this is very important. Okay? So multi-threading, uh, it's quite good for memory-bound algorithms because threads lie on the same uh, memory. Okay? So if you have a RAM and the memory addresses are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then if you have a thread, then that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is specific for the thread. Now, uh, decision tree based algorithms, random forest, you know, decision trees, uh, they highly utilize memory in terms of computation. So, it's good for memory bound alg uh, algorithms like this. Uh, threads are easier to implement, it's much simple because you don't need memory management. Whereas, multiprocessing, it provides more throughput than threads because you're utilizing the processors. Now, it's uh, no, better for algorithms with high CPU consumptions, such as neural networks. So again, you have to ask, hey, data scientists, what are the algorithms that our model use? And if they mention similar like neural network, we're using neural network, then you know right away, ah, I need to probably implement this in a multiprocessing approach because it consumes a lot of CPU. And I need a lot of throughput. But again, this one is more difficult to implement. Keep in mind this too. This is very important. Last thing about the architectural challenge that we've encountered is, uh, software engineer, we need to provide the glue code for the data scientist. So it's not like the data scientist will hand over the model to us and then poof, suddenly application appears. No. Definitely it's not going to happen. If it can happen, then we're going to run out of jobs. Um, yeah, we need to utilize interfaces and functions and we, we need to have several class definitions like this one. So, when I'm talking to our data scientists, I told them that, hey, let's just agree on one thing. I'm going to give you an interface. Make sure that these two functions in my interface exists in your model. So I don't care about the other stuff. I don't care about if they create another function. As long as these two exist, I'm good. Okay? And in my interface right here, uh, I mentioned here that I will raise a not implemented error if this gets executed. Are you familiar with method overloading, method overriding? So basically, we, over, uh, we override the methods. Because once the machine learning guy creates his model, so the data scientists will create their model, and they will just need to extend it to model interface. They need to define this two function, and I don't care what they do for the rest. So for this one, random forest classifier, fit x, y, and they do some other stuff. Then for the predict, I will just return the predicted results. So we overrided these methods right here. Use the, uh, use, use the abstracted method uh, decorator, by the way. I think it's going to throw an error if, you're, if you didn't use that. So if, let's say, for example, the fit function doesn't exist, and I call my model that fit, it's going to throw an error. So on the application side, it's easier to catch the error because you know when the error will happen. Again, this is pretty much, this is a really simple solution, but I cannot emphasize how important it is to do some similar things like this when you're integrating with the algorithm or uh, the data science team. Because this, this goes a lot. This saved my life so many times, literally. So yeah, these are the interfaces. Now, we're going to go in with the deployment. There are several options for deployment. Again, we can use the cloud, which has, quote unquote, infinite resource. So here's a sample set up in Amazon. Or we can have local deployments which have very li limited resource. So this is Raspberry Pi, or do we? Oh, Raspberry Pi. There's the Pi. As a software engineer, we need to consider this information. Again, I, I always mention it. I, 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 I think I've mentioned this quite a lot. So identify if the model will work better in the selected environment. 
Will it work better in the cloud or in local? How will you be able to identify this? Remember the multi-threading threading thing and the CPU versus memory thing? So if your model, did I put it in the next slide? Yeah. So if your model, for example, needs a lot of memory and a lot, uh, a lot of resource, then probably it's going to work better in the cloud. If your model or the model from the data scientist uh, has needs to consume minimal resource, then it's probably better in local. You need to provide the inference so the data scientists can adjust. They don't know this stuff. Okay? You're going to be their guide. You're going to pamper them. You're going to help them. So that they know how to adjust their code. Now, uh, are anyone familiar with this notation? Oven. So it's like the speed. This is the time complexity, by the way, not the space complexity. So how do we scale up? At least in our setup. If your algorithm or the, the runtime of the model takes more than O of n squared or like more than polynomial time, even if you scale in the cloud, it won't work. Once a bit. So even if you have like several clusters and the runtime is more than this, it's going to have a difficult time because this, this scales up as well. So I suggest if you encounter this Runtime. As a software engineer, we need to be able to understand it to be able to verify if this is the runtime of your code. If you encounter this, talk to the data scientist. Uh, hey, um, I noticed that the algorithm is O of n squared. It means it's going to run exponentially. How can we fix this? Okay. Now, for scaling down, first is you need to identify the space complexity of the setup. So the space complexity is the amount of space that the data, uh, that the algorithm will use. So if you see that it's going to consume a lot of memory or storage, probably it's not good to put it locally. And then for the runtime, uh, you can identify that it's a good, uh, this should be your target. Uh, F is the size of the feature, feature set uh, times n log n. So if you can do better, then good. But if you have n squared performance on a local setup, eh, good luck. So this is good. This is a good target. So I think this is the runtime for a random forest algorithm. That's why they perform so good in small resource machine. This is the runtime of the alg algorithm, the random forest, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. Now, during deployment also, please make sure to have continuous integration because as a, so a responsible software developer, you need to have this. So as you can see here, this is one of our setup. This is on Slack. So every time the machine learning uh, does something, we notify if it's a success or not, if the build is success or not. So yeah, that's just your basic maintenance stuff. Now, I want to be a data scientist. No one okay. I want to be a data scientist. What should I do? I'm a software engineer. I want to work in the data science field. Personally, based on my experience and based on the experience of people that I've asked, this is the best way. Most of you might think, oh, there's like tutorial online, resources online, but data science has a lot of math. You know the common algorithms that you see? K-means, lasso, regression, ridge, neural networks. Those are just like, what, 20% of the actual resource that are available for machine learning. 20%. You're missing out on 80%. And the 80% is on here. Grad school offers data science courses. You know, it's very focused. Uh, I think usually there's like one year courses and stuff. I'm currently taking my computer science uh, master's in computer science, but my minor is data science. So it's, it's proven very effective. <laughs> now, you can find the related jobs. Most of the people who want to shift into a more data science career find internships. It's pretty common. So don't worry, it's paid, I think, hopefully. <laughs> so we don't violate employment laws. Uh, yeah, internships provide a good alternative of learning. So 
you can also pursue data engineering. So for those of you who are actually doing late data engineering stuff, it's not data science, just to be clear, but it's close enough, so good for you. Um, you can also do research. I think the World Health... Is that, what's the health thingy for the World Health? World Health Organization. Uh, they, are ask, they are looking for researchers that will facilitate PhD students. So they are good mentors. So I, I knew someone, a software engineer, who uh, applied for the research and it involves training. Now he's working under uh, a PhD student in Europe. So he's learning a lot. And he's earning a lot. Now, again, this is a disclaimer. Again, taking online tutorial lessons are often not that good, but it's probably up to you. So depending on how you want to approach this, that's probably a okay, case-to-case basis. Now, it's all thanks to Python. See? Because for software development, there are always continuous addition of features and usages. So, for example, this one, I think it's added in 3.8. This one is in 3.3, 3.2. So these are very useful in terms of uh, releasing applications that are related to uh, machine learning. This one allows us to simulate multiprocessing on a thread level. So quite handy. And I think this one allows us to um, attach metadata into several classes. So Python is also prone to paradigm shifts. So before Python is a scripting language, I'm sure lots of you know that. But now uh, it has functional support, it has object-oriented support, that's why it's ideal for software development that has a lot of integrations. It has a rich library for application development. So if you're into web development, maybe you, you want to use Flask. We're using Flask as our microservices that integrates with the machine learning. Uh, and again, it's very friendly to microservices uh, structures. Now, for the data science part, it has data classes. Python supports data classes, so it's good for data science. Uh, it supports an ample amount of data-driven development. There are a lot of features that you can use. So, super extensive data science libraries, Sectern, Pandas, NumPy. I'm sure you know them. And it's very easy to use for data scientists. So, with that, I hope you learned something today. Questions? It's gonna get thrifty, guys. Okay, I'm good. Uh, so we have a list of questions, many questions. I hope you can finish them. Okay. Uh, so the first one is like, you create a class for training data. How about testing data? Will oh. will they also share the same interface with training data or not? So it, it depends upon the use case. You can like uh, create a separate training data, uh, testing data class that has a property called the result. Okay. So it really depends upon your use case. My main point is create a small layer of abstraction in each of your data pipelines. That's very important, and that's the takeout. So to answer the question, you can, it's up to you on how you want to design it. You can pattern it similarly, but always use a small layer of abstraction. So next question. Did you consider to use scikit-learn interface as your model interface? If yes, may I ask the reason about your considerations? Sorry, can you, can you repeat? Uh, did you consider to use scikit-learn interface as your model interface? Um, let me see if I interpreted the question correctly. So uh, I think for those of you who attended Takashi's talk earlier, at least in our use case, we try to pattern the interfaces that we have to existing libraries so that the user of those libraries will not be able, you know, they won't be confused because they've seen it, they've used it before. So if, if that's what you're asking, then we're trying to pattern the libraries that we have or the interfaces that we have to existing libraries so that it's easier for the developers and data scientists to use and utilize them. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you do the? Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, how do you do the source control to the notebook written by whatever data scientist or uh, software engineer in like a Git? Oh, yes, that's a good question. Huh, why did I didn't I include that? Anyway, so for uh, we have uh, the source code for the machine learning, or for the data science part, and then we have the source code for the machine learning part. Uh, for the application part. For the application part, we just 
do how you actually do your versioning. We use Git, of course. Uh, and then the versions are independent from the machine learning side. The machine learning side has, uh, they're, they're releasing, once they release a new version, they just tag it. And then when we look at the tags, we look at the specific notebooks associated with the tags and that's how we use their algorithms at least two months ago. Because right now, we automated a lot of things. So if the data science team wants to release a new version, uh, we created a script for them. It's an automated script that will just allow them to type a command, specify the version, and automatically, all the current deployments that we have will use that specific version. So it's easy to roll back. So let's say they want uh, another version from a separate application for a separate application. We can roll back using that automated script. For the easy answer, just uh, separate the version control for the machine learning part and the application part. For the much more fun answer, create a script that will do that for you. So yeah, thanks. Uh, next is a very popular question: How to stop scientists that use Jupyter? Sorry? How to stop scientists to use Jupyter? No, you don't. <laughs> I mean, my teacher in the university, I, he's a data scientist. He doesn't like Jupyter Notebook. So there are scientists, uh, data scientists that doesn't like Jupyter Notebook. They exist. But for the most part, I think using the notebook is quite convenient for them. Again, their focus is to output the model. Their focus is the model accuracy. So if they can do that better using Jupyter Notebook, then you don't need to complain. Just live with it. Trust me, I've tried. Uh, okay. Uh, so follow follow uh, follow up of the version control question. Uh, would you roll back your model if some performance is bad, or how do you control the A/B test model? Oh yeah. So performance, performance. So. I guess we have that issue quite recently that there are some, there are, there are certain models that doesn't perform after the release. So we actually have two options. If there are a lot of changes that is being done on that specific release, we try to patch it as quickly as possible instead of rolling back. Because sometimes rolling back might take longer because you need to consider are there data transformations? Are there pre-processing steps that was added? If there are like a lot of those that is added in that version, and those are important, just create a new version as soon as possible that is improved, that has improved uh, performance. But if if the issue is just performance and there's no issue about the code structure, again, we just run the script, specify the old version, and poof, it became focal crunch. No. It's okay. Poof, it became okay. So, yeah. Uh, last one in the CEDO. Data scientists use uh, Pandas a lot, the, mm -hmm. libra the library called yeah. Pandas a lot. How do you do data class modeling to the data frame? Sorry? How do you do data class modeling to the data frame? Ah, uh, okay. Let's see if I understand your question correctly. So, you have Pandas and you have the data class and you want to convert that class into a data frame, right? Uh, essentially, there are several methods, Python specific methods that can do that. In Python 3.8, I think I've shown one of the examples. There are data classes. Data classes are very much useful if you want to convert the actual class, the properties of the class, and convert them into a NumPy array or a pandas data frame. Okay. So you can use tempo, uh, simply like dictionary unpacking to be able to do that. Uh, but in our use case, uh, I think there are several intermediary steps we convert to NumPy first. So it actually depends on the data scientist. Again, as a software engineer, my concern is the input and the output and the performance of the mod, uh, the performance of the application using the model. So if the data scientists have their own implementation of things. I just need to make sure that the input is correct, the output is correct. But to answer your question, you can use intermediary NumPy uh, processes, or you can use data classes and dictionary and packing. Okay. 
Uh, we got one more new question. Okay. Uh, what are good options for storing machine learning models to use in applications? Oh, 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 yeah, that's a good question. I spent two sprints for that. Um, let me see, can I say it? Okay, 25 seconds. So, do you know Pickle in Python? So you have a class, you Pickle it, you store it as a file. You store it in the secondary memory. That's one good option, so that it doesn't consume a lot of memory. So once the model is created, and you've used it, but you want to store it and use it after some time, you know, pickle it. Specify which file needs to be unpickled, and then you can use it after. So pickle, pickle is the term for Python. Right. I uh, hope the question, uh, the answer from these uh, can answer most of the question. And if you still have a question, uh, I think these will be outside later. So uh, feel free to find the uh, speaker later. Uh, so next talk will start from 10 minutes later. So let's give the applause for these. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you.